Now we're going to use light in another way. I saw, I told you that we're going to see two different light arrangements. And we've seen infrared light. Now we're going to use yellow light. You'll see the light going on in, the mo in a moment, but I need to explain the nature of light. So just come along with me. This is something that I need to explain with models, first of all, because otherwise I think you'll, you'll find it difficult to take in from the equipment. So let's, let me just remind you of the nature of light. Here we have a Royal Institution ray of light. Okay? And it goes up and down like that, as you see. And it will shine through things, of course, which is extremely familiar. But this ordinary light that we see coming through windows and so on is, is chaotic. It wriggles in every direction. But for the purposes of the experiment that we're going to do for you now, we want light which will wriggle only in one direction. That direction. In the direction now, that plane. All right, that plane. And that is what we call plane polarized light. Now, we can make plane polarized light in the following way. We take a chaotic ray of light and we put it through a special prism. We can call that a gate. It's like a, it's a special prism, but we can, we can regard it as though we're going through this gate. And if we have another gate through which this ray of light can pass like that, that's fine. This plane polarized ray of light can go through this one and it can go through that one. Right. Now, if, however, we turn that gate at right angles like that, then our ray of light can't get through that gate. Can't get through. <laughs> it slipped. It can't get through there, and so that one blocks it off. Okay? I was just forcing it a bit too much. Right. Now let's see that in operation in what we call here a polarimeter. Notice now that we've got <coughs> some yellow light and it's shining through this device. Now this, this is a lovely scientific antique. This has been in these laboratories for about 130 years. So this is not a modern piece of equipment. It's an antique which is lovely to have working for us again. Okay, so it's a 130-year-old instrument, and what I want you to see is that the light is shining through the polarimeter, and what I want to do is the equivalent of, of closing the gate. I'm closing the second gate just by moving that like that. That closes the gate. This instrument, or one very like it, figured in the greatest chemical realization of the 19th century. And that realization involved a bottle of wine and a brash young man in France by the name of Louis Pasteur. Let me tell you the story. It was already very well known that if we take a bottle of wine, a good quality wine, such as they have in the Royal Institution, and you pull the cork, what one finds is a cork which is covered with crystals. And these crystals are crystals of tartaric acid. But if we pour some of this wine out, just so we can see the nature of the wine. Then another tartaric acid also appears in this wine. Now there's a difference between these two tartaric acids because although they have identical structures determined in just the sort of way that we've been used to determine the structures of molecules as we've seen, they had one very important difference. 
And that is, when these crystals on the cork and settling out in the bottom of the bottle were dissolved in water and placed in the polarimeter, they affected this plain polarized beam of light. But when the acid, the other acid, the other tartaric acid, separated from the wine, was put into the polarimeter, it had no effect on the plain polarized beam of light. So this was a great mystery. And it was a mystery that senior chemists of the age had been unable to solve. The year was 1847, and they had given up this problem for lost. They had capitulated. But this brash young Frenchman, Louis Pasteur, felt that it was not right to have a mystery such as this pass without an investigation from him. And so he looked at the crystals of the acid, which had no effect on the plain polarized light. And here they are. When he looked at those crystals under the microscope, he was able to see a subtle difference between them. And that was that they had facets which were respectively right-handed and left-handed. And that put into Pasteur's mind the idea that these might represent different tartaric acids which were related as right and left. And so he took this acid and he examined it under the microscope and he separated it, seeing these crystals and being able to recognize the fact that they were right-handed and left-handed, separated them into two little piles, left and right. And he dissolved them in water and placed them in the polarimeter. And we can now reenact for you this marvelous moment in the history of chemistry. He took the pile on the right and put it in the polarimeter. And notice what happens. The gates were closed and now that has opened the gate. If you just close the gate again, Bryson, so we can see, that closes the gate again. And in order to close that gate, Bryson has had to move that round about 30 degrees to the left. Now Pasteur took the second pile of crystals and he dissolved them in water. I should have mentioned that. He dissolved them in water. The gate closed again. But this time now, it's opened the gate again. So it's had an effect on plain polarized light. And this time, in order to shut the gate again, watch, Bryson has to rotate it. The same amount, the same 30 degrees, but this time in that direction, in the equal and opposite direction. And it's so Pasteur realized at once, first of all, it's nothing to do with the crystals, nothing to do with that because there aren't any crystals in the solution, but that this acid from the wine, which had no effect on plain polarized light, was a mixture of two separate molecules, both of which affected plain polarized light and in equal and opposite directions. And so Pasteur said of these molecules, these two tartaric acids, they're like my hands, my right hand and my left hand. That's how they're related, and they don't match. When I put my hands on top, 
I have a right thumb and I have a left thumb. And he said, this is the relationship between these two tartaric acids. They are like my right and my left hands. And here are the models of these two tartaric acids. Let me just show you that. If we start here, just let me sort of wave you through the molecule. Start here, and we, as we move out, that is on that side with its hydrogen atom there, but that's on the other side. This is on that side as we move away there. So these are like Pasteur's right and left hands.